For millennia, the city of Bethlehem has long intrigued scholars. At the heart of the city rests a series of caves. These caves have long been the source of religious rituals, beliefs, and practices, many of which are traced back to the biblical tradition and the birth of Jesus Christ. While the city has changed over the years, questions about its history continue to grow. Join us today as we debate that history and we discover the origins and history of Bethlehem's architecture, art, and religion. Okay, welcome everyone to Religion, Art and Technology. Today is another Art in Revolt special, Christmas special, in which we will talk about the city of Bethlehem. I'm Sharaf Gantarin. I'm joined by Amanda Firiasi and Rebecca Kaufman. And the question I want to lead off, starting with the discussion, is really the question about uh, representations of art in the city of Bethlehem. What I find so intriguing from very little that I have read about Bethlehem is that it's a city in the West Bank and it leads to Jerusalem, but there's this massive wall that the Israeli government uh, constructed and visitors, whenever they do come to Bethlehem, tend to find that wall, uh, it, it draws their attention. There's a lot of art on the, on the wall. But then there's also a question about the renovation of the Church of Nativity, which has been around for so many years, uh, thousands of years. And uh, I'm interested if you guys have any thoughts about its history and how it has, uh, evolved or sustained itself over centuries of uh, occupation and uh, so much political upheaval and what role, how could the church of nativity be seen as a kind of an artistic, um, I don't know, emblem of Christianity perhaps uh, with deep connections with Islam as well since so many Muslim uh, uh, empires in the past like the Ottoman Empire would have, uh, you know, uh, they would have a Muslim uh, person hold the keys to the place and even to this day, uh, the area that is technically in a Palestinian municipality. So I find that really interesting. So who's producing the art? Who's conserving the art? Uh, what is the church's relationship to the city? And how could it help us understand the importance of art uh, for people who live through such political upheavals? So either one of you could start off with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to start, Rebecca? Man, my brain is trying to decide which track to start on. <laughs> like all of those things. Um, That's why I'm having you go first. <laughs> yeah, I noticed. I noticed. I Thank you. Um, should we do the historian trick of start with old and work to today? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. That means I start. Um, I mean, for context, for context, oh, maybe for I'll just context. echo yeah, what Cher on. said for a quick start of, yes, the city of Bethlehem. Um, which is known as the birthplace of Jesus, who is a religious and historical figure that does have a lot of intersections across, especially Abrahamic traditions, um, Christianity and Islam in particular as a prophet Messiah figure um, and Christianity also a deity. So that's some fun extra layering to get to consider. Um, I think I mentioned the term Bethlehem means house of bread which had some embedded symbolism and meaning within that, you know, again, across religious understandings. Um, and I'm sure Amanda can tell us a little more about historic context of what Bethlehem looked like historically or what it functioned as, um, especially in relationship to the city of Jerusalem. So maybe do you want to lead off with a little bit of that? And then I can yeah, sure, talk sure. about church nativity. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think so. I'm the old person, the ancient person, so <laughs> I'll do it antiquity. Um, I'm obsessed with antiquity. So yeah, Bethlehem historically is actually mentioned um, by the ancient Egyptians. So we actually do have some references to it. But when it was referenced um, by Egyptian leaders, it was referenced as a stopping point. So the city of Bethlehem, we know historically way back when ancient Egypt ruled and the Hittites were in power, 
was a resting place for people who were traveling from Egypt or um, up north to Syria, well, various directions. It was basically like a, what today would amount to a trucking stop, <laughs> right? Like um, a town on the outskirts where you stop to get some food, some rest, um, there'd be inns there. Of course, we know that from the biblical story, there were inns in Bethlehem. Um, very important because there's references in the Bible to this past. Um, because at the time of Jesus' birth, um, it would have functioned similarly in ancient Rome as a town on the outskirts. And not only was it a town on the outskirts, kind of like a trucking stop, what it amounted to, it was also ruled for a particularly long period of time by the Philistines which is pretty important in the Bible because the Philistines are not liked. Um, Samantha and, or, I'm sorry, I'm like, Samantha's, <laughs> the, oh, Samuel, right? Or no, wait, 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 I'm getting it wrong now. God. Um, what's the guy with the long hair? Samson. Samson. Yeah. <laughs> Samson. Also and Samantha. Lila. <laughs> yeah, also Samantha. Remember Samantha? Rebecca <laughs> was looking at me like, yeah. <laughs> oh, I failed. I failed. See, there you go. Um, Samson and Delilah. Um, the Philistines are, of course, greatly feared and hated. They're the ones responsible for cutting his hair as he falls in bed with a Philistine woman. Um, they're probably one of the most hated um communities in the Bible, which is, of course, why also ancient Rome, when they eventually burned Jerusalem to the ground in 70 CE, um, they renamed the territory from Judea to Palestine, which means of the Philistines. Um, and they did that to put salt in an open wound to Jewish communities, naming their area after their most vilified and hated enemy. So historically, Bethlehem isn't just like a town on the margins or the outskirts, but it's also one that would have been historically associated with foreigners, enemies, um, potentially the greatest enemy in the Bible, which is also interesting too. So at the one time it's focused on foreigners, it's a traveling place, it's a place on the outskirts. It's not at the center of power, but what is very interesting is also in the Bible, it's associated with, of course, King David. Um, it's supposed, and this comes from the book of Ruth, which is very um, interesting, but it's the supposed site of David's birth um, and where David is crowned king. Um, so it, it's, it's also has this like, which King David is probably a big deal, but of course, King David rises to power as a guy on the margins, as a man on the outskirts. Um, so it kind of makes sense that there is where he'd be crowned, not in Jerusalem, but at, at a truck stop at a, and I'm not just talking about like any old truck stop. This would have been in like a dilapidated one, right? Like this would have been like one of those in some rural, what we today would associate with something like, um, because back then, even though it's still close today, back then it would have been considered maybe a little further than we would consider it today. So it was really kind of something like maybe a hundred miles from a big city, something like that is, is probably what it would have been associated with. So it's, it's got this like, um, interesting tension there between both being at the center and the margins of Jewish history, Jewish ritual, and Jewish belief. On the one hand, it's associated with Moabites, um, Hittites, um, Philistines, foreigners, Egyptians, and on the other, it's a site where the great King David is born, um, and where, of course, um, the New Testament then has infamously depicts Mary as going there, leaving Nazareth and going to Bethlehem. Um, and there is where she gives birth to Jesus because the idea is that the authors want to link David's lineage with Jesus to make him the Messiah. Um, so they have them returning. And of course, it's very interesting because as I tell students, Mary returns to Bethlehem because they're under occupation. She's not going there because she wants to go to Bethlehem, <laughs> okay? Um, she's going to Bethlehem because she's forced to. She's living under occupation and the Romans have demanded that she go back to be counted. And what's interesting is why is she being counted? There's a census. Who has implemented the census? census? The Romans. The Romans have a census for two purposes. Number one, taxes. Uh, they wanna know how much to tax. 
based on how many people. But number two, they're not just taxes, they're counting how many firstborn males are in the town. Why is that important? Well, because back then your firstborn male would most likely be, have to submit to the Roman military, would have to subscribe, um, would have to join the Roman military. So they're also counting the men, um, men, male children, because they wanna know how many they can potentially recruit. So it's also a recruiting mechanism. And back then, of course, many um, Jewish males would have joined the Roman military. Um, so it's, it's an interesting, and so I think in some regards, like to just kind of finish up this antiquity thing and then you can take, take it from there, Rebecca. Um, you know, it, it, I don't necessarily just think it's about linking Jesus's lineage to David. I, I think that there's something else going on there. And the Bible, because David is an outsider too, right? Like, um, I think that the Bible is having this return to Bethlehem. It's kind of this tension between this idea that Jesus is not just for Jewish communities, but he's for everyone. Um, the message is for everyone. It's for those on the boundaries of society. It's for those on the margins. It's for those at, um, to some extent, the trucking stop, um, in between, not necessarily within um, Jerusalem itself, right? Like this, this is somebody who is for both Jews and for Gentiles, which is a big point of the Gospels. It wants to make a message both for Jews and for Gentiles. So I think that's a big part of it too. I also think historically, when you look back at Bethlehem, it was just not on the margins politically, historically, but also religiously. Um, when we look at the uh, ancient remains of Bethlehem, not, not, there's quite a bit of evidence that the people who were living there were worshiping Greek and Roman gods. <laughs> so um, to such an extent that, of course, infamously, as you're going to talk about, where the spot where they choose the Church of the Nativity um, was associated with a Roman god, um, the worship of a Roman god. Um, uh, so I think that's interesting. The grotto or the cave that is eventually going to become the site of the Church of the Nativity is associated with a Roman god and the worship of that Roman god. Infamously, uh, Romans worship caves, worship the idea of humanity's emergence from a cave because that's where they believe creation began. They began, the creation of humanity began out of a cave. Caves, that makes a lot of sense. Caves are historically mm -hmm. associated with wombs. Um, they're dark. Um, there's where a lot of things come out um, from darkness to light. So it, it's interesting there to see, I think this kind of, um, borderlands and this border, this in-between state that Bethlehem represents comes even today with the Church of Nativity, selecting that as the site where they're going to build it is not, I think, an accident. Um, I think it points to this idea of Christianity being this kind of in-between state between Judaism and Greek and Roman religions. So well, and just to jump off that, yeah, I mean, it's probably important to say that the person who instigated building the Church of the Nativity was Constantine, mm -hmm. right? And who is Constantine? Well, he was an emperor, basically trying to do just that, to rule Rome through linking, I guess, like Christian and Jewish histories and integrating that into um, like a Roman belief system, right? Quite, quite famously, like marrying pagan symbolism um, into how we depict and understand who the, who the figure of Jesus was. And so I, I agree with you. I don't think there was ever an accident when Constantine built a basilica, you know, I think he was very intentional about making claims about in part the triumphalism of Christianity, because that was definitely part of his game as an emperor. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it wasn't just about this like multicultural acceptance of everyone. It was like, no, we dominated you. There's a <laughs> yeah. big giant church on top of it, <laughs> you know, yes, uh, which yes. is, you know, let's say a historic remnant that probably has continued through a lot of history is like find a spot, claim it, build a big church on top of it, um, or put a monument on top of it, or, you know, whatever, whatever your totem is conquer, right? Um, but in addition to like empire, uh, Constantine, you know, being the interesting figure that he is, 
has a lot of um like reverence still you know so even if it is political it does seem like there are important things that he tries to do that um does give nod to like there's being sacred sacredness within all of this um so yeah i mean the basilica itself is a really fascinating building and has seen a lot of you know ebb and flow throughout the decades or centuries um including being burned and destroyed and changed and rebuilt and all those kinds of things um i think before we get into like maybe some of the more contemporary history sort of the last couple centuries um i was gonna ask share i know like a huge part of the history is actually under ottoman rule um or during islamic caliphates as well so i don't know if you want to speak to maybe some of that part of the history i just found out that recently about four four years ago somebody went uh, to the church and what they found out is there was a lady around 70 years old a muslim palestinian woman who held the keys to the church and uh, she was quite, uh, she didn't reveal too much about her feelings, but it seemed like it was a tradition that does date all the way back to the Ottoman time. So I don't know too much about the Ottoman history, but what I did learn is that this was no aberration for a Muslim woman to be holding the keys to the <laughs> church. What it does make me qu- uh, ask a question to you two, so, since I'm playing that kind of role of a moderator, is I find it really interesting. So one thing Amanda brought out is that you go to, when you look at the period of antiquity, Bethlehem is a city on the outskirts. It's a place where the foreigners come, where the truck drivers come, and is using kind of like our contemporary imagery to, to rest and uh, to rejuvenate and on their travels. And then uh, as Rebecca, you said, like Constantine will, uh, you know, make it a kind of an example of Christian universality as well as Christian triumph. Now, as somebody um, out of the three of us, you're the only one who's been to Bethlehem uh, mm-hmm. and done the, uh, you know, perform that role that that has been asked in the song come all ye faithful to Bethlehem you're the only one who's done it (laughs) I'm wondering what does it feel like to be in that city so does it have that feeling of a city on the outskirts uh, or or, or, you know what does it mean for it to be like in a contemporary politics of Palestinian intifada got Israeli Mm -hmm. security checkpoints does it feel like you know a place that everyone comes to or does it feel like a place where nobody can come to and uh what does it mean for this place to be now uh, a city? Uh, and, and you know what? And what about the people who live around the church? Because what I find so intriguing is the song "O Come All Ye Faithful" references Bethlehem, and we sing it during Christmas all all the time. But we don't know much about the people who live around the church. So, as somebody who visited, if you could describe what it felt like and what did you see when you visited? Yeah, let's just jump in. Um... Yeah, contemporary Bethlehem is probably very different than the experience of Jesus, although the idea of being under a government occupation maybe has some parallels. Um, Today, as you mentioned, there's a large wall, you know, people have different terms for that wall. I think a more readily acceptable one is the apartheid wall between Israel and Palestine there. Um, I guess just to bridge, you know, so we had the Ottoman Empire that was there for centuries. And then uh, the role of Britain following uh, the First World War, so like 1918, and the end of the Ottoman Empire, Britain took over um, kind of control of the area. And then through the 20th century, you know, there's different different things that kind of ebbed and flowed. So after 1948, it was under the rule of Jordan for a bit. Um, and then it was taken back by Israel during the Six Day War. And then since 1995, it's been under the Palestinian Authority. And so um, even just like those three, four um, kind of global powers taking ownership over the city, I think that shows the complexity, right? So like when you say who lives in the West Bank today, um, you know, I think the narrative is often Palestine is Muslim, um, but the West Bank quite famously has a really important historic Palestinian Christian population, um, one that's diminished quite a bit uh, because of all these conflicts. And um, some of that's been through immigration and some has been through you know, actual physical loss. Um, but it's a really important historic um, aspect of what Palestine has been. And so um, you know, that's, that's the surrounding community. And it is interesting as you said that you know there's a muslim person that 
um, unlocks the door. And I've heard of that in several sites where basically, how to say this graciously, um, interreligious conflict, <laughs> you know, just leads to that, that question of like, we can be here as long as we're not the ones calling the shots. <laughs> so we find that like neutral third party to kind of give that give that to you and that just uh, alleviates a little tension. Um, probably don't need more tension than is already occurring. Um, but yeah, so in visiting, you know, to go into West Bank, you do pass a border, you know, there is a there's a wall, there are checkpoints. Um, you know, as a tourist, they make that a fairly accessible thing to do. So, you know, if I come with an American passport as a tourist pilgrim and like there's a lot of terms we could talk about you know but tourist pilgrim of um you know coming to see sites of religious significance um that's a really common reason to enter the west bank so uh you know most people come for a couple hours see the church grab some falafel head back that's you know that's the experience um the church itself i mean is really really remarkable um the they do maintain the cave kind of grotto area, you know, where it's like that, is it the actual place? Who knows? But um, it's the place that said to be the birth, you know, and so at least in a pre-COVID time when I went, I'm sure it might be a little different now, but it was just like packed with people, you know, dark, very atmospheric, um, incense, candles, you know, all that kind of thing. And then, um, you know, quite understandably I was not there during Christmas uh in particular but I was there closer to like orthodox um orthodox epiphany kind of celebrations uh but it's just absolutely packed around December and January um it's a really popular time to go um yeah and I don't know if anyone has other thoughts on the site itself before we go into the broader context of just the apartheid wall and some of the other visuals that we see there, but. Continue, yeah, I'm really interested in that. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, so because it is such a well-known crossing point into Palestine um, and because it is relatively more accessible than other parts to foreign travel, thinking like, you know, trying to go to Gaza versus going to West Bank would be different experiences. So like, Church of the Nativity, because it's such an important pilgrimage site, remains fairly accessible um, to cross into. And because of that, the apartheid wall has become a really common place for street art, um, because that is a place that lots of people will see, you know? So, um, you know, if you're feeling particularly isolated and like you don't have voice, you know, that is a place to visually express that. Um, and so, you know, there's, not just Palestinians, but, you know, international artists, Banksy included, you know, has pieces that are all along the apartheid wall or make historic reference to the apartheid wall. Um, and I mean, part of my scholarship has been looking at um, iterations of different travel posters um, that encourage tourism or pilgrimage to Israel, Jerusalem, Palestine. Um, and one that I spent a lot of time researching was called Visit Palestine, which was actually done by, um, he was a Zionist immigrant to Israel from Vienna originally um, by an artist named Franz Krauss, and he was a graphic designer. And, um, you know, tracing the visual lineage of this poster because it was just a really um, widely used poster in a reappropriated context along, along the West Bank. And the context was, um, this Zionist Israeli immigrant Jewish, you know, um, pre-statehood um, graphic designer making a poster that says visit Palestine because that's what it was called, you know, so it's pre-statehood, so it is Palestine. Um, and it was actually David Tartikover who reprinted that poster in the 1995 context. Again, thinking about the context of the Oslo Accords, that's probably some important context to be thinking about. So he prints it in um, like an art setting, right? Like in a museum. And when I saw the poster, it was not in a museum. It was just, you know, reprints, like totally unauthorized reprints, uh, probably printed off of like home computers, you know, just like up everywhere. Um, and that was over a decade ago. And it's 
a visual image that just continues to be used and the Palestinian artists started to reuse it again just going hey the visual significance of this you know scene of Jerusalem but with the language of Palestine asserts a certain kind of presence that's being denied and so some of those posters um, you know instead of it being a nice scene looking down into the city of Jerusalem you have a very strong visual image of the apartheid wall basically saying if you visit Palestine this is what you'll actually see and like Banksy actually made a painting that's Mary and Joseph trying to cross into Bethlehem and they meet the apartheid wall you know so it's a lot of contemporary um, commentary on what actually the experience of going to Palestine is and especially if you are Palestinian what the experience of um, others coming might be and I think for me within all of that you know, it puts a really interesting framework on what it means to be, I mean, if the correct word, word is pilgrim, but let's use that word for, you know, maybe lack of other things, um, you know, not just tourists, not just people coming to see whatever we want to see, but people coming to specific points of sacred value with specific agendas of um, finding, you know, spiritual spiritual experiences right because that's what pilgrimage is for you're supposed to go to these specific spots so that you're at the site of something happening and you experience it right so that's what church of the nativity is as you go because jesus was born there you're not just going because it's a cool church and if you do that within the context of this experience you know kind of what what are the things that is a part of your actual pilgrimage you know is it just going to touch a cave or is there more to that, um, taking all of these things into account? Sorry, that was a lot at one time. <laughs> Amanda, do you wanna jump in? Uh, I'm just really interested in this very fascinating uh, tension. So one hand, you got this place where everybody goes to, you got the tourists coming. On the other hand, you got this wall that is, definitely there to regulate who can come and who can go. Uh, and then that interesting thing you said, you got Palestinians uh, who are living there, but uh, they have to confront the fact that it's a, it's a place for foreigners as well. Well, simultaneously of this art depicting the paradox that in contemporary Bethlehem, maybe Jesus and, and Joseph would not have, we have access to the city. It's just so much of this interesting back and forth between a place for everyone, a place that no one can go to, a place for foreigners and the foreigner versus the local dynamics. Uh, I don't know what, what kind of question that comes out of it, but I find that like productive tension quite like peculiar to like out cities on the outskirts mm. because like you have this tension between the local, but because it is a local place, it's always being uh, regulated spatially in ways that other cities perhaps are not. I don't know. I would not know how to compare it to Jerusalem or other outskirts with the center cities and other places, but that's sort of a thought I have. I don't know, Amanda, if you got anything to say in response. Yeah, no, it sounds like um, it is. It, it, well, it's in an interesting situation because it is a site of like, I feel like, in terms of Christians, that Christian Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Muslims, it's almost like um, I like it, it's um, I think embodies that which it once was in antiquity, even more so. Like to some extent, like I feel like it's like the culmination of centuries, millennia of what I've been talking about. This productive tension, because I think it is a productive tension of I think places on borders are always, um, there's hostility, there's violence, there's conflict, but there's also beautiful art. Um, there's, because in order to redress that tension, I think art allows us to redress these uh, paradoxical tensions in our society. I think it's only art that allows us the effective way. I don't think it's violence. I think um, we resort to violence when art fails us, um, which is why I get so, um, nervous when art disappears. Um, and I think, you know, the restoration process that began in like in the late 2000s um, to restore working with Italian artists, working with artists around the globe, um, I think has been important for 
the site's development and also just for, I think within Palestine and Israel, um, this wider dynamic. I don't think the church is like this, um, I think, like I said, I believe buildings are alive. I believe um, and the environment is alive. I believe um, that grotto, there's something there um, that is alive, that is actively shaping and influencing people who go there. Um, as Rebecca talked about the effects of this place on her, which clearly had effects. There is something there. I just don't think um, people build places and spots for random. I think there is something there. Um, you cannot deny it. I, I, I haven't had, I've had experiences of like um, other places going to that have had effects on me, but it sounds like something there is alive. Um, and whatever it is, it's there to draw out this paradoxical tension at the heart of humanity, which on the one hand, we want to create communities of insiders, yet on the others, we know that that leaves out so many that should be integrated within our society. So there's this larger struggle of being within networks, an in-group and an out-group while having these networks um, and these identities. Ultimately, our identities fail at, um, sorry to get into like a larger, larger metaphysical explanation, but such is life. Um, <laughs> I, I think to like kind of lead it into technology, this is what I think is like at the core and gives way to things like computing is, you know, we have these complex networks where we know that we exist in these complex networks of interaction and communication. Yet on the one hand, we also want these singular identities that bring us some comfort, some nostalgia, um, while also driving towards the creativity of these boundless networks and that which it manifests. Um, and I, I don't know, but it sounds like the Church of the Nativity, every component of it from the art, from the walls, from the restorations embodies that. And I think that the experience that Rebecca was talking about, it seems like it did have that effect on you. Like you felt something. Um, yeah, I mean, part of that, you know, you go and think, keep enough space as dark and light incense and like candles and you'll you'll experience something. You know, it's like that multi-sensory thing. Um, but no, I mean, I think terms like procession are so important. And I think we always think about that when it comes to like the architecture of a religious site where it's like, oh, you have forecourt and you have entrance into the sacred space and things like that. And I think what hit me about the experience of going to this particular place is like your procession, if you want to think of it, you know, starting in Jerusalem, because that's where most would start in the process of entering you know, and the experience of crossing that wall being part of the procession to your pilgrimage site, I do think you have to take that all into kind of your spatial and um, like sensory awareness of participating in it. And um, I was thinking about what you were saying about, you know, what is it about the essence of the place, you know, and what is that and how, how that might be something that's intercultural or interfaith experience. Um, you know, and Church of Nativity was actually listed on UNESCO World Heritage Sites um, just in 2012, which is really recent, actually, when you think about a site, like dates all the way back to Constantine. Um, and it's actually the first um, UNESCO World Site in Palestine. You know, so that comes with a political recognition as well of saying, you know, in order to say this has historic value, you have to acknowledge its placement. Um, you know, and that had repercussions and is really interesting to think about. We don't have to go into the full, full context. Um, but it's also a site that, uh, this actually goes back to what Cher was saying, um, that's called, um, it's under his status quo. And status quo is actually something that comes from the Ottoman Empire, but it's basically an interfaith understanding of this site is so important you know, we understand there's tensions between us as religious communities, and we're just putting that to the side for the sake of this site. Um, and I think there's nine total between Jerusalem and Bethlehem that has this kind of interfaith status quo understanding. Um, and it's a term that I think is used in other holy places as well that have these historic tensions. But it's just a really interesting thing when I think about, you know, when we talk, when we talk about sacred space, things that normally have lots and lots of tension embedded within them and still yet having that recognition of this is just more than that you know like that's what sacred is is it's a set apartness so if it's more than that 
um, you know, and everyone's ability to kind of understand that. And maybe listing that through UNESCO is one example where we go, it's world heritage, you know, it's not one community's, it's everybody's. And that's a process of that. But then also this, yeah, like interfaith understanding and recognition of just, it's beyond any one of us. Um, you know how that plays out daily. That's a whole, whole other level for sure. I like the phrasing more than just the tensions because that's different than saying not the tensions uh, or the absence of the tension or somehow right. like getting away from the tension. So I was wondering, Rebecca, on the procession, I'm thinking about that more than the, t the tension. It makes me think like the tension is somehow actually contributing to this more than itself, right? Like that, that sacrality mm -hmm. is actually constitutive of the tension, but not to be reduced to the tension, right? It's somehow it's mm -hmm. this profuse excess that comes out of the tension. So on the procession, as a, I suppose I'm going to use these categories just, you know, for the sake of it, a foreigner, a Christian, a woman, an American, uh, how do you see these tensions, uh, uh, the more than unfolding? Because uh, I'm wondering, are you surrounded by other quote unquote foreigners, Christians? Are you meeting locals? Does, do those binaries collapse in the midst of the procession? Are there people who are not in the procession that you can see into like on the streets? I don't know. Or, and does the procession then ultimately disintegrate when you go to eat falafel? I mean, how does it all work out? Right. Um... I would say this, you know, of any travel experiences, part of that is what, what you make it, you know, so you can let yourself just be escorted to your one place on your tourist bus. And that's the experience you have, you know, is you've been guided to exactly a one hour experience. <laughs> you know? um, so if I were to talk about accessibility, which is maybe a good way of phrasing it of, you know, you you can find experiences that are not this, but if you just signed up for the tour and went, I'm going to go see the Holy Land, let's go see what I can find out about it. Um, you know, from that US Christian tourist bus experience, I mean, yeah, you're going to see, you're going to see the song and dance of a holy site, you know, which is get dropped off, see the church, go back to Jerusalem. Um, if you're paying attention, you might look at some things on the way there and back from your bus seat, you know? Um, and that's, that is an, a very accessible experience. And I will be honest in saying that, you know, other people I know who have been to Bethlehem who have experienced their trip from that lens don't even talk about the other stuff. <laughs> you know, they, they don't remember the Banksy piece or they don't, they might remember having to stop for a minute, but you know the government isn't really there for the purposes of American Christians and keeping them out from Jerusalem. So, you know, like it isn't, it is a, it's a tension that you could be excluded from completely if you choose to be. Um, so I do think that matters, right? Because. Um, Anytime there are borders, you have to wonder who the border's there for. Um, and I think that influences a lot. So yeah, I mean, Bethlehem is also understandably, like its industry is tourism. You know, that is its economy. And so, you know, even just taking a minute to go down a side street to buy, I mean, famously embroidery is um, a really important heritage craft there you know and they're just really incredible incredible craftsmen everywhere um you know and like that 30 seconds of exchange that isn't within a curated experience you know it still might be somewhat curated because it's still a, it's still a tourist shop or it's still you know even a craftsman shop um but it at least gives you a second to kind of think about it in a different context maybe It makes me wonder, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, I guess I'm going to stick with Rebecca, but Amanda, you're more than welcome well, <laughs> Welcome to chime in. I was wondering like who would be the ones selling the embroidered goods and what the ambience would look like because for a city to promote itself as a touristic city, I suppose it has to disassociate, uh, you know, fears of the place being violent. And we tend to historically, generally speaking, gender these 
distinctions between touristic mm-hmm. and safe versus violent because violence usually is associated with hyper masculine uh, conflicts. So I wonder, like, uh, embroidery tends to be, traditionally speaking, uh, at least in the area where I'm from in Balochistan, it's usually done by women. Women are usually mm-hmm. good at crafts, not necessarily all the time, but often we see like it's some, you know, some it's associated with women's uh, talents, I guess. Was it the same the case in Bethlehem? Did you feel like there was a certain femininity to this touristic attraction of Bethlehem? Um, yeah, that's an interesting way of thinking about it, gender to like that. Um, I So to agree, I do think embroidery is typically um, like a feminine craft. Um, I would say like the places I went were kind of family run, you know, where it was like, you just see a little, everybody multi-generational, you know, like if that's what you have for your life, that's what your family does. So um, yeah, you know, and it's not the only thing, like they definitely sell stuff made out of a hollow wood and, you know, just the kind of the stuff you expect to see um, kind of in a Holy Land tourist situation. Um, but I am sure, I'm sure that is still a curated experience compared to the experience of living in anywhere in the West Bank. And we also have to remember, you know, West Bank, comparatively is a larger area of Palestinian territory that not at Bethlehem, but not far away from Bethlehem has increasing encroachment from settlement that, you know, is, is not, um, well, technically by international standards, legal settlement, settlement, um, you know, with, with Israeli borders kind of encroaching. So, um, yeah, again, you know, if you stay within a certain radius of the of the church, you'll probably see a nice family shop, you'll get to chat a little bit, but you do have to wonder, if I went one mile that direction, what do I see, you know, um, and I think that's the important thing as well, is, how do I say this, it's not that the experience of a sacred site has to be only the understanding of um, political tension, you know, so, uh, but how important is it to not ignore that it's there while you're there, you know, Um, and a lot of that obviously always comes down to like your intention in visiting a place, you know, is it to come for spiritual reasons, is it to come for others, depending on your belief system, how you separate those things, you know, for some people, they're inseparable, for others, those are, you know, politics and religion are different sides of a coin so um yeah it's just you know it's such an individualized thing in that capacity I guess Amanda how does gender play into the history of Bethlehem during antiquity was it seen as a place that needed to be dominated by for by like you know when you think when you brought up that thing about Mm -hmm. like the diss against the Jews by calling it Palestine uh this oh the Philistine sorry not not to be con- conflated with contemporary Palestinians, but like the land of Philistines. Uh, was that a kind of like a masculine move onto the Jewish community? Because uh, I think about a city that has been existing for such a long period of time, a church that has been around and been renovated routinely, but simultaneously this conflict that's existed all the time as well. Uh, how does gender help us understand that paradox? Oh yeah, it's a site associated with like definitely women, women mm-hmm. foreigners, foreigners, uh, Ruth. So David's only born in Bethlehem because of Ruth. Uh, Ruth goes there um, in the book of Ruth. Um, that's where she goes uh, with Naomi, her mother-in-law. Um, she crosses the Jordan River to go to Bethlehem from Moab, Moab to, because um, infamously wrote Ruth is a foreigner, uh, a Moabite. So Mm -hmm. that's, she crosses the river Jordan because the Jordan separates in antiquity and then you got the Dead Sea. It's what separates Bethlehem from Moab. And so she crosses the Jordan River to go with Naomi. Um, Her mother-in-law infamously stays with her. Um, I always like to point this out to my students that uh, the marriage vows, when you say your marriage vows in the Christian church, they're based on the vows between two women, Ruth and Naomi where you go, I go. And that, that line, that is the, the vows are the vows made between two women. Um, 
a daughter, a daughter-in-law and her mother-in-law. Um, so I, I just think that's an important point to point out. So Ruth is a foreigner, yeah, and crosses to go to Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem, that's where she sustains herself. She's an independent working woman um, who <laughs> seduces Boaz um, when he's drunk um, and it gets him to have sex with her. So, <laughs> um, just saying, just saying. Uh, How goes? that's how it goes so she finds a job she seduces her basically he's her employer he runs the business um gets him drunk and then has sex with her and then she's like now you gotta marry me <laughs> he's like i guess so <laughs> um and that's and then david descends from the line of ruth so this is how it happens uh so yeah historically bethlehem is associated with one of the most I think I, I sometimes I wonder how the book of Ruth got in the Bible. Like I really do. I'm like, this book is mm -hmm. incredible. Like um, it's so interesting. The story of women, the way it tells the story. I, I mean, I, I down to my heart, I'm like, this was written by women. I don't know. It's just the, just the way it reads the way the mm -hmm. love between a daughter-in-law and the mother-in-law. It's just, it, I don't know. It's, it's speaks to me like a, uh, like a woman um, wrote mm -hmm. it, but and it's an incredible story. So that's why David is, of course, born in Bethlehem because he just de de descends from the line of Ruth. So yeah, his, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was go like, ahead. isn't um, Rachel also yes. buried in Bethlehem? Yeah, there's another right. really important um, like forebearer in the line and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Great point. Yeah, Rachel. That's right. Dies in, uh, in childbirth, right, and is buried there, giving birth to Benjamin. Is that right? I believe so. Yeah, the only one that he, Jacob, really loved. <laughs> only... Right. right. Um, yeah, so she's born there. And again, kind of this idea, like Bethlehem wasn't the spot where they were staying. It was a transitional point. So she was buried kind of on the road. Right. Um, yeah, good point. And then, of course, historically, Mary, that's where she's from, so has mm -hmm. to go to. So, yeah, it's the whole line of descent. And what's infamously known in... Um, shoot now my bible knowledge is bad is it luke or matthew i'm pretty sure it's luke where the line of descent is through women only mm. pretty sure it's luke <laughs> i'm pretty sure oh all the bible nerds are probably like ah <laughs> uh, yeah so um i think it's it's one of those so um that emphasis on the maternal is emphasized there too. So yeah, Bethlehem. And that's why I think it's interesting too, because it's associated with that cave, um, with a grotto. And I, I heard that there's like a series of caves too beneath Bethlehem. It's not just that one cave, hmm. but caves historically in ancient religions, they're the oldest form of religious worship, mm -hmm. the oldest form. Um, and again, usually associated with goddess worship. Um, mm -hmm. That would be usually associated with goddess figure, a woman figure, because um, again, the historical associations with wombs, vaginas, they just lend themselves <laughs> to a cave. So um, that I think is fascinating too. So I think it probably was historically, we know associated with goddess worship. So and it yeah. makes sense. I think it was um, at least one side of Aphrodite worship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think, yeah. I think it was Adonis and Aphrodite, like it was one yes. there. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, yeah. With Hadrian, I think Hadrian mm -hmm. and Hadrian builds kind of like a monument to that. I think. Don't quote me on that. Uh, yeah. So I think that this maternal stuff. I don't know what to make of it now that because I've never really thought about this. But I thought that this would be this. Now that I'm thinking about it, this, would be a great, interesting paper we could publish. But <laughs> <laughs> we just wrote it here. It's great. We just wrote it here. Yeah. But yeah, there's something there that is deeply maternal, that is mm -hmm. deeply womb-like about that area, which yeah. would explain its position as a border because wombs are the border between life and death. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they are the site where death becomes life. Um, so I that would make sense also why it's a border physically, spiritually, emotionally politically <laughs> politically I mean, it just well it becomes entrenched right i mean if you're a person that thinks about energy of sites right oh i do right and so um yeah i think i think that just affirms things when even as you go further back in time mm -hmm. yeah starts to make some layering make a lot of sense 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I do think there is something there. I, I always, I have students go out to sites that they think might be, I know it's like a hippie thing. They're always like, oh my God, what are you making us do? Um, but I've had a lot of students, you know, doing these exercises that they have come to see. I don't think it's a coincidence. I can't, I can't believe um, that it's all there. Cause I've had these experiences before that there's something about the site that does make it, that is, we're seeing the productive, what we assign to politics. I think there's also something there environmentally, geologically, metaphysically, um, that we lack the words or the logic to understand. Um, And I think that it's art that best embodies, like I said, I think the politics becomes becomes the crutch when art fails us. And I think, uh, that's that's why I think it's a site of great art. I'm not surprised to hear that. Um, and I think historically it, it it was as well. You know, it's always been associated with great art. I like to think historically uh, Jesus is. I'll just point this out too, right? He's not a carpenter. He's described technically as an artist mm-hmm. um, in the Bible. Uh, the word, the Greek word, would have been used with artisan. Mm-hmm. So, and I hate to tell those big Bible people out there who might be listening, but there weren't a lot of trees. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, it's possible he could have worked with wood, but wood back then, it more likely, uh, probably not. It, it could also mean that the word also means in addition to artisan, um, engineer too. So um, engineer, artisan, but craftsman. So, and I don't think that's a coincidence either. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's good. Is that good? We kind of finished it up, sure. I don't know if we got. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, for the listeners, I was just going to say, think about the difference between the story of Ruth and how womenhood is breaking down discrete identities, the mm-hmm. specifically Bethlehem as a city of foreign women, they constantly disrupt any sense of a stable, discrete identity. Mm-hmm. And then to, to think about it in, in, conjun- in relationship to Constantine, who also has a very universal understanding, Christianity is not just particular to this group, but everybody, yet there's a certain triumphalism of Christianity over other groups, which mm-hmm. I perhaps... Is, is, is a little different than the story of Ruth, whereas Ruth is actually more terrifying and, and, and cool and cooler, <laughs> you know, because you can't really figure out, you know, which tribe you want to sit, put her in. She's a foreign woman uh, and uh, has, you know, is, is out there and uh, yeah. making decisions on her own, making new families. And I suppose that's sort of the key thing about Bethlehem. Because with Rebecca's story too, with the procession and, you know, it's very structured and stuff. And there's always this question of what's happening a mile away. I think it's probably the fear is always the chaos of not being able to demarcate people into discrete. That's the Christian there. That's the Muslim there. That's the Jew there. And that's the foreign visitor there. But the sense that the city, as you said, Amanda, like is this metaphysical power to bring people into complex networks and familial relationships that can completely uh, transgress the existing norms like Ruth does, I suppose. And I, I just think it's this struggle that testifies to us today with our technologies. It really does because um, with computers, we are coming to exist within these complex networks of interaction where our singular identities no longer make sense. Um, they no longer, we can no longer use our singular identities to make sense. Yet at the same time as computers are unraveling these singular identities, we thirst for them more than ever before. I am this race, I am this religion, I am this ethnicity, I am from there. You see this heavy emphasis in a way that like my grandparents didn't, like my grandparents transgress like a million boundaries Um, (laughs) um, from crossing continents to uh, you know, infamously, my my the marriage, my my grandma was much older than my grandfather, but they didn't care. It was like the, the transgression of boundaries um, in a way that we today often don't. Um, we have more of, in, in my view, we kind of have this obsession with sing- our singular identities because they're no longer relevant. Um, 
that we've come to exist within these complex networks of interaction um, that leave us kind of longing for comfort, longing for nostalgia, this, the nostalgia of the past. Um, and I, I think it's, it's good. I think that, you know, it is what it, you know, that tension is good for society, I think, in the long, long term, because we will come up with creative solutions to try to, to address that tension, which I think we are. So, but I think that this, this issue goes all the way back to Church and Nativity, Bethlehem, the entire, I mean, it, it testifies, it's not irrelevant for anything going on, but it is, we are the great, 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 great grandchildren from this paradoxical tension. Mm -hmm. I know we like to think of ourselves. That's why I think I like antiquity so much because when you look at antiquity, you're like, wow, nothing's changed. <laughs> the settings changed, the clothes have changed. The problems are the same, right? The foreign woman, always a problem. <laughs> As we all know, maybe we can speak from experience, the bringing the outsider home uh, yes. to the mother. Big problem. <laughs> You know, we're, we're all way to traumatize her. Yes. 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 No we doubt. all felt it. Bringing, bringing the foreigner home. So um, I think that's why I uh, love antiquity. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. This was great. Rebecca, thanks. Uh, share for leading. All right. Well, we'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.